webcam. Can you see us? Hello, Joanna. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, we can start. Merci beaucoup à tous d'être là pour cette table ronde sur l'espace européen des données de santé, une opportunité politique. I will switch now to English, if that's okay for everyone. We will speak slowly, but this is an international table because it is uh, for the French EU presidency, which has started on January 1st. So I'm switching to English. And this round table is about the foundations for the European health data space, whether it's an opportunity for ethics. So to provide you some context on this roundtable, uh, we all know that access to data and the ability to use it is a key factor to accelerate growth and innovation. Data-driven innovation can bring major and concrete benefits to improved health policies, to better healthcare systems, but also to better improved uh, and improved therapeutic solutions. Now, since early 2020, there has been a European data strategy which has been published, and it aims to make the EU a leader and a, uh, of a society empowered by data. So creating a single market for data is the goal, and that's also what uh, the European Health Data Space Joint Action TEDA seeks to do. And now we're also expecting a European regulation proposal, and uh, Joanna, who is now with us here actually from Brussels, will tell us about this proposal. So this round... <laughs> Oui, je pense que je vais la développement des biotechnologies en chirurgie plastique. Salle D, Atelier Biformat Startup, un match pour l'hôpital. And I'm taking over again. So now, we, as we've heard other uh, parts which are going here, back to the European data strategy, European health data space. So and on January 1st, as I mentioned, the EU, uh, the Fran France has taken the EU uh, presidency. So we're now leading, we're at the spotlight of digital health, also with the French Ministry of Health. And that's why we're going to discuss many different topics today in this roundtable around the European health data space, but also how we try to underpin it with ethical principles for digital health. So these are some of the, the things we're going to discuss today. So what are the key objectives of this roundtable? The first one will be to discuss what is the secondary use of health data? What do we mean by using health data for secondary purposes, for innovation, for policy making, and so on? The second objective is to speak about TEDAS, this joint action TEDAS that I mentioned to you that prepares the grounds for the European health data space. The third one will be to, to discuss the European health data space impact assessment. So what is the current state of play with regard to this proposal, which we're expecting for April? And then last but not least, we're going to speak about those ethical principles for digital health that have just been published and that will play, that will be the foundation for this European health data space. So I'm, I've spoken a lot. I'm really excited now to introduce the panel and uh, the speakers which are here with me are really one of the key actors around the European health data space. So I'm starting with uh, Frédéric Debruquet, who is Director of Health Economics and Reimbursement of the Reimbursement Department of Medtronic a major medical device company with very international presence. And she has a lot of experience with health data and also works currently in different activities related to the structuring of health data. I have also here with us Joanna Maria Gligor, who is actually in Brussels, and she is head of unit for digital health, European reference networks, uh, B3 at DigiSanté at the European Commission. And she's the major actor behind the regulation for the European health data space together with her team. We have Markus Kaliola, who came here to Paris from Finland, and he's uh, the project director in Health Data 2030 and TEDAS, the joint action that I mentioned to you. And uh, he's based in, in Finland, and he works for CITRA, which is the National Innovation Fund. And last but not least, I have two more speakers from France. So I have Emmanuel Bacry next to me, who is scientific director at the French Health Data Hub, the unique gateway to access health data for public interest research, but he's also um, a sign, uh, scientific, um, he's also director at the French National Center for Scientific Research, the CNRS, in France. And I have Isabelle Zablit, 
who is um, Director for Europe and International Affairs at the French Ministry of Health at the eHealth Ministerial Delegation. I welcome all of these speakers here with me, and I'm now starting the panel. So I have my first question, which is directed to Marcus Caliola. So Marcus is heading TEDAS, the Joint Action for the European Health Data Space. So he's basically preparing the ground. He's doing lots of field work, field studies, and he's trying to understand what are the key barriers, the key enablers for the European Health Data Space as part of TEDAS. So Marcus, I have a very simple question for you. What does secondaries of health data mean, and what do you do in TEDAS, actually? What does TEDAS stand for, for the people here who are with us? Thank you, Luisa, and uh, very nice to be here today. So what is secondary use of health data? When we are being treated in, in hospitals or, or primary care, a lot of data is being collected. Uh, diagnosis data, imaging data, laboratory results, prescriptions are being written, stored in the electronic health records and so on. This data is used to treat us, and that's the primary use of health data. The secondary use of health data is when the same data is used for other purposes. For example, it's authorities steering and supervising the healthcare providers, or making public health decisions. During the last years, a lot of decisions have been made based on health data, COVID data. That's also health data. And you can easily understand that the better the data is, the better the decisions will be. And the more accurate and timely the data, the better the decisions. Is. But secondary use of health data is also research and innovation. And for me, I think this is the biggest part of the secondary use of health data. We need to understand how the medication or treatments are working. And to understand, we need to look at the real data that is being collected at, 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 at healthcare. Also, new innovations and, and product developments need data. We have a lot of companies here today and for example, AI applications need data for, 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 making the, the new, uh, for teaching the algorithms, for example. So this is also a secondary use of health data. What Tehdas Joint Action then is doing, Tehdas comes from, it's an acronym for words towards the European health data space. So we are there to prepare, we are there to support the European Commission and the member states in the forthcoming European health data space regulation. The project started a year ago and will end mid next year. We have 25 countries involved and uh, we work in the fields of governance models, health data quality, infrastructure, citizen engagement and sustainability. That's in short. Thank you, Marcus. So 25 countries, that's quite a huge effort. And I believe, Joanna, you have been working with some of those countries as well while you were preparing the uh, legislative proposal for the European health data space. Could you tell us in a few words what you expect for this European health data space regulation and what did you deduce from the impact assessment that you conducted uh, late uh, last year, actually? And thank you for joining from Brussels. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, indeed, we have been working very closely with the several member states uh, uh, both in the context of the primary use of data and the secondary use of data. So what do we mean by the primary use of data and secondary use of data? And that's also a little bit how the, um, we are looking at the European health data space uh, uh, approach and also the, the legal proposal. We are meaning the use of data uh, for um, the collection and use of data for uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, which is also based already on the fundamental, um, on, on several rights which are enshrined in the GDPR, and also the possibility to reuse this uh, uh, data for research poli policy making and regulatory purposes. And what uh, the impact assessment has um, uh, shown us, and also the public consultation and discussions with the, with the member states and uh, with different stakeholders, uh, they have shown us that there are a lot of barriers to. Um, uh, that prevent people and healthcare professionals to access and to port their, their health data for um, uh, provision of healthcare. And this also impacts on the quality of the services that people uh, uh, get. For instance, if someone has an allergy and the, and the healthcare professional doesn't know that that person has an allergy, the, um, the product, the medicinal product that uh, that person is prescribed may, may not take into account of this um, uh, aspect and can have even 
uh, um, fatal consequences. Or if someone uh, would like to have a second opinion and cannot share, for instance, the, um, the data, the images, let's say, uh, between uh, two healthcare professionals or providers, um, that would also uh, require redoing the same test, uh, important costs, uh, etc., etc. So this is this is on the primary health of uh, use of health data, and this is what we are trying to 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 uh, um, uh, tackle and take to uh, in, into account. The problem becomes even more more serious when it comes to the sec to the cross border uh, uh, sharing of data. So just imagine, for instance, that um, uh, one is going on holidays and uh, would need to see a healthcare professional in another member state in a foreign language. Maybe sometimes that the, that person doesn't speak or the, 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 the professional doesn't uh, speak um, uh, his or her language or, uh, or another international language. The communication is much more difficult. And... Um, there, the, the member states and the Commission have uh, set up already uh, an infrastructure supporting the patients to share the data with healthcare professionals of their choice in the language of the healthcare professional. And I'm very happy to announce that uh, France is already part of, of this uh, sharing and can get the health um, professionals in France, they can see the information of uh, foreign patients in French. So these are all elements that we would like to take forward and to support the, 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 the access and, and sharing to this data. And when it comes to the secondary use of data, what, uh, what um, Marcus was explaining, the question is how can we make sure uh, that the data can be reused. The impact assessment again has shown us a lot of difficulties for the um, researchers, but also for the public authorities. The COVID crisis has shown a lot of problems for uh, AMI, ECDC, etc., to reuse the data in order to uh, take informed decisions. And this is what we are trying to uh, address in the context of the legal proposal, but also uh, with the support of. Um, uh, the joint action they does, and also ideally with an infrastructure that we hope uh, will we will start rolling out uh, uh, in the in the upcoming period. Thank you, Joanna. So we heard about primary and secondary use of health data. So before we just talked about the secondary part, and we're going to focus more now for the next part of the discussion on the secondary use of health data. And you mentioned the pilot. Uh, you mentioned first of all the My Health at You, but now we're going to speak about a pilot project actually, which is. Um, trying to test what this European health data space that you mentioned, Joanna, could look like. And I'm very happy to have uh, Emmanuel Bacry here, who is representing at this roundtable the French Health Data Hub, to speak to us about this consortium that he reunited around this European health data space pilot project. So if you could tell us yeah. a few words about so this proposal. So thank you very much, Luisa, for inviting me. So yes, indeed, uh, the Health Data Hub is leading a, cons a candidate consortium to the call that was published by the European Commission in October. and we. We deposited our answer uh, late January. Uh, it's a very wide consortium. Uh, we are, I'm not going to name all the, all the institutions of the consortium, but you have to know, I think it's important to notice that uh, there, are, uh, more, there are eight uh, national, uh, national platforms with a national mandate. So we have uh, Finland, Denmark, Norway, Germany, Belgium, Hungary, Croatia, and France. And we have two European agencies with us, EMA and ECDC, and we have some uh, European and international research infrastructures also, and some other institutions. I'm not going to list all of them. So the, the goal of this pilot is twofold. So the first objective is to uh, build a network between with all these existing infrastructures build pipelines between all these platforms okay and the pipelines will have three uses uh, the first use is to be able to have a central portal uh, on which you will be able to run some queries on the metadata catalogs of all the different platforms. So you'll be able to run a query like what kind of uh, database uh, is available on which country about diabetics of uh, type 2 and how many males are there in the database, how many females and so on and so on. These kind of queries you'll be able to run it from a central portal. That's the first use of the, these pipelines. Second use that you'll be able to fill up online a unique access form 
in order to ask for access in several countries. So you don't, we won't have to go through all the procedures. I mean, you will still have to go through all the procedures, but just using one simple access form. And third use for these pipelines would be uh, to eventually move some health data from one platform to another one if it is needed for your research. And of course, if you got the authorization to do so, which is going to be, of course, certainly a big problem, but we'll, we will have to address that. So this first objective is about the, building this network. The second objective of the pilot is to run some use cases at a European level, uh, answering some scientific questions uh, in order to, uh, to see and to prove how impactful it can be to run some research projects at a European level using data, health data from different countries with all the problems that, of course, that, will, uh, that, that are coming with that, which is about interoperability of the data, so uh, standardization and all, all, that, all that stuff. But so these are the two, uh, uh, two objectives. And for these use cases, we, in our answer to the call, we listed nine different use cases. And uh, if we are selected, then the commission will have to select a few of them out of these nine uh, uh, use cases. Sounds really promising. We're very much looking forward to seeing the results and to see uh, how, how this will go about this pilot project. Thank you for telling us more. Now, I'd like to hear the private sector as well with Medtronic to hear a bit about the expectations towards this European health data space. We, we all speak about this and we've heard lots of different perspectives, mostly from private sector and research organizations. Now, what does Medtronic uh, think? What do you think uh, about this European health data space concept and what are your expectations? Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this roundtable. Um, we are extremely supportive of this uh, European health data space. As a, a medical device manufacturer, basically we are both producer and user of data. We produce data through our medical devices, through our remote follow-up systems, but we also use data from uh, hospital data or claims data from the health uh, insurance funds. So, so that's very important for us to, to really ensure we use the full potential of those data, both at, as a pro primary usage, like in remote follow-up, or secondary usage. Um, for us, this is really a great, great hope to complement what's happening in real practice, in presential practice, to use the digital um, uh, situation and, and data. Uh, but we have prerequisite that we need to, to share between public and private. And I think it can be summarized in, in one big idea, which is how to build trust of all stakeholders. Um, and when I mean stakeholders, first of all, I mean the citizen and the patient. Um, that has question as a citizen, I have question. Uh, why are, do you need to use my data? What will be the objective? Is it uh, to fulfill a public or general interest or will it be only a private one? You are a manufacturer, you know, so, so um, will I give my consent and how it, is it going to happen? Also, I've heard that those data can be re-identified when they are pseudo-anonymized or they can fully be anonymized. So how will you, will you protect that and protect my sensitive data? And last but not least, and uh, is, it's about what are the methods you would be using to, and, and that um, uh, go to your scientific question, Emmanuel. Uh, what's the method you will be using? Uh, will you induce bias? You are, you, you'll be building uh, artificial intelligence algorithm. So will you induce bias? And, and then I will have uh, bias in the way I'm, I'm taken care of by my healthcare providers. So that's for the patient. And now the question from the manufacturer side and the researcher is, I think, more about what are the quality of the data, the norms. Um, will I have, have fast access and easy access to this data? What is the governance? Uh, will it be equivalent among the European countries? So that's easy for me and I can really create a market. Also, what will be the business model? What will be the cost to access? Uh, because we have competition in this area from Israel, from the States, from, uh, from other jurisdictions. So, so that's really all the question that we need to answer through this, uh, this, this wonderful project of the uh, European Health Data Space. 
Thank you, Frédéric. I think you raised some of the major concerns that have been addressed or are being addressed right now while we design the European health data space. And I'm really glad now to hand over to Isabel Zablit, who actually has been pushing a lot towards the, the adoption of the ethical principles for digital health at the European level now, as she's also leading the, for digital health, the French EU presidency. So um, I would like to hear more how this resonates to you, Isabel, and how do you think ethics needs to be underpinning the European health data space? Well, this is something, in fact, that is uh, one of the three pillars of the roadmap of the digital health implementation in France. Uh, this is something which is really uh, at the center for action. So um, if you scale up to Europe, of course, the same questions will still exist and even more, as Frédéric said. So it was for us very important to put this in the light of the the work already in place, and certainly after what we have been experiencing during the pandemics. Uh, I used to tell that I was extremely proud when we started the discussion uh, re regarding the uh, EU digital COVID certificate, so in France, the past sanitaire, because uh, even if it, if it wasn't maybe obvious in the media, uh, the first, the very first question uh, that were put on the table and coming from a lot of countries basically were how are we going to um, create this EU digital COVID certificate in a trust environment and with the an alignment on ethics. So it was something which had basically never been formalized and uh, we shared the feeling that it was very important that the citizen would uh, understand what are the, the ethical, what, what is the ethical framework behind. So, um, having said that, um, even if it doesn't answer all questions, because uh, we have other pillars, uh, you know, in place, and, and certainly in France with interoperability and security, which are also handled in this context. Um, and it, being in the <laughs> in the driving seat, I would say, uh, uh, from a member state's perspective uh, during the French presidency, we believe it was extremely important to formalize those integral principles before moving forward. I mean, before getting this uh, regulation uh, that is now expected in the coming days, I would say. <laughs> Um, and um, we did something what was probably a challenge for us, but a very nice challenge, and because it was a citizen-oriented challenge, is to negotiate in a three weeks period of time this uh, European text. And everybody told us it was impossible at European level to do so, but we said if we, do don't, if we don't try, we never know uh, if we are going to succeed, and it appears that it was unanimously adopted. So uh, for us, it was really worth the, the effort. And um, we, you can find it, uh, I, I think, uh, easily online. By the way, it's made of uh, 16 principles against four dimensions. And uh, with one of them, which has been recognized to be a, a pioneer one, because it's the eco-responsibility. And there are few countries which have already that uh, in place. So the good thing is that. Um, we, it gives us uh, now a clear framework to move forward. If we hadn't do so, we believe it would have been a showstopper for the coming regulation. And um, the, the commission, I don't know if Joanna is, already, is still online, but the commission has been also uh, uh, making sure that the coming regulation will be aligned with those principles. And this is really something very important for us for, to move forward. Thank you for these uh, strong words and this ambition, and I hope we can take it for all of the actors which are part of the European health data space and the future projects. So thank you, Isabel, for having brought light to that. Uh, now, speaking about ethics, and we hope, obviously, that those ethics principles can appear as part of the regulation or be at least cited or be part of the foundation. Now, again, back to TEDAS. Do you address the topic of ethics, like citizen consultations, or any other topics that are being part of those principles? Could you tell us a bit, little, little bit about some pr first achievements of TEDAS that address these issues? Yes. So, so two questions, whether we 
covered the ethics and uh, some of the, the first uh, results from Tehdas was the, was the question. So I would say that this, uh, the ethic part and, and the citizen part was not as strong in the beginning of our joint action. But we included citizens as, a, as one work package in our, in our work. And the more we work, work in, in this joint action, the more we realize how important that part is. It, it comes, as, as, as Isabel also mentioned, it comes in all discussions all the time. All the panels that we participate, we, this discussion raised uh, about ethics and, and citizens. So we are really glad that we actually took this part into the joint action. So we are doing currently a citizen survey uh, in European wide, asking how they feel about the use of health data, what are their concerns. We also study data altruism, which is a practice where citizens can donate their data for, for research purposes. So ethics and citizen engagement, is the importance is, is growing in, in the European projects. Now you asked also about the, the important outcomes of the, of the joint action, so maybe I raise one here. When we started, we, we probably had the idea that, that technology and, 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 and semantics and, and data questions are important. Besides the citizens, one aspect that has become clear is that actually legal challenges are preventing the use of health data much more than technical challenges. We made a study of 50 scientific papers and we interviewed experts in Europe and we found out that more than 50% of the barriers of using health data is, is different legal interpretations of topics such as, such as what are pseudonymization, what is anonymization, uh, what is secondary use of health data, uh, topics like that. Countries have made national legislation on top of the general data protection regulation, derogations are different and so forth. So it's actually the legal problems that we face and the European researchers deserve a single market where they can do research uh, on, a, on a common basis. So what I'm looking for the European health data space actually more than anything is to streamline the legal base for doing research in Europe. Thank you, Marcus. So bridging now from the EU level and speaking about, uh, about TEDAS back to the national level with the French Health Data Hub. So the French Health Data Hub is often cited as an example to follow, like as a unique access gateway to access health data for public interest research and does respond to, does address, has addressed some of those questions that Marcus just raised in its model. So could you tell us a few words how the Health Data Hub seeks to maintain citizens' rights, confidentiality, privacy, security in its model? Yes, so first, well, I'm not sure we are an example to follow. I mean, that's pretty heavy to carry, you know, something. Uh, I don't think there is one model for being a national platform. Uh, even though we have some common basis like GDPR, as Marcus said, each country has its own specificities and you cannot just apply one model that is even working in one country. Not that I'm considering that the Health Data Hub is fully working, but it's okay. Uh, and just apply it somewhere else. It doesn't work uh, like that. Um, so, however, after two years, uh, I, I guess we can share uh, some lessons that we have learned to contribute to the construction of what uh, should be or what could be the European data space. And of course, I agree again with Marcus that the main bottleneck is everything about jurisdiction and legal stuff. I mean, this is one of the main bottleneck and maybe the most difficult to address. And hopefully the legislation texts of the European Commission will you make something uniform through all the countries that will simplify the work of every country in that matter. Now, from our uh, own experience, I would say that, yes, as you said, there are many key points. So you mentioned security. So for the Health Data Hub, we have centralized the, we, we centralized the health data you need to work on and on a very highly secured uh, scalable platform. So you remotely, uh, 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 log in to this uh, secure, uh, securized uh, space and of course you don't have the right to take the data out which is and and there are full of protections for that and everything that you are doing is logged so that there are 
there are regular audits made in order to see whether you try to do it or not. And, uh, and of course, you don't have also the right to try to re-identify people. This is very important. Researchers need to work on very refined health data, not aggregated data most of the time. So we are talking about pseudonymized data. The Health Data Hub gives access to pseudonymized data, never directly identifying data. We never have in our whole data pipeline, we never had the right to have at any moment any directly identifying data, okay? Now, of course, with pseudonymized data, you have to be very careful because people can try to re-identify. So again, we are logging everything and we are working on automatic algorithms that would try to ring some alerts if something uh, wrong is uh, happening. So that's for uh, confidentiality and uh, security. Citizen rights, okay. We are, we are doing an uh, opt-out system. There are very few opt-outs, very, very few. That's, that's something that you should know. I mean, it's very interesting. Even when you have papers in the newspapers or on TV, TV shows saying, you know, be careful, or when there are data leaks like the one we, there was uh, on, uh, on APHP and stuff like that, we receive maybe 10 emails or something like that. I mean, it's very, very little opt-outs. Uh, we have, of course, the citizen affairs department working in, at the hub, working closely with the health associations. This is very important. Creating, disseminating a culture around health data. Education is a key point, is a key priority. We all agree that uh, we have to have the consentment of the citizens in order to use their health data. Now, the consentment has to be a clear-minded choice which is, let, let's say it clearly, which is not at all the case today, okay? Because it's so complex. What is health data? What can be done? What cannot be done? We're talking about AI. What, cannot, what can be done with AI? What cannot be done? It's full of fantasies, full of fantasies, positive fantasies, like we're going to solve all the problems with AI, and full of bad fantasies, like, okay, there are these insurance companies that are going to steal the data, and, and they are going to do some scoring and, and stuff like that. So we have to, the education of the citizen is a priority, and it should be a very, I mean, as much as possible, objective education. Not try to orient the citizen towards uh, sharing of the, of the data or not, trying to give, to talk about the risks of sharing the data, because there are risks, there is, there is not such a thing as zero risk. The risk can be very small, but there is also a risk, but you have to know, every citizen has to know what is the real risk and not try to invent some fantasies about what can be done with the, the health data. But we have also to talk about the risk of non sharing which is something we don't talk a lot about. And this is extremely important. And once the citizen has all these in his mind, in her mind, then he will be or she will be able to do a clear-minded decision about consentment. Some will say no, some will say yes, but that, that will work much better. That's indeed excellent, and especially because it, what you just said resonates totally with the digital health uh, ethical principles that Isabel just mentioned. So we feel like there's lots of venues for collaboration, but maybe not only on this area, maybe also with the private sector. And that's why I'd like to hand over again to Frédéric to see why is it important also to, to go for, towards public-private collaborations to achieve those goals that we mentioned here. Yeah. First of all, if I may just explain how we, we use the data. Uh, as a manufacturer, so you understand also what's, uh, that, that's, we always have uh, um, some collective interest in mind uh, because that's important. The first thing that we do for, for years already is to use claims data to prove in real life benefit of our medical devices. And it's usually a ask from our health authority like the Autorité de Santé in France. So that's the first thing that we do and it's, it's an ask by the authority. The second thing is that we use our data to better understand the patient pathway, which patient will benefit more from a device than another, 
We did that, for example, for a very small pacemaker um, that, uh, where we, we use claims data in the States and in France and compare which type of patient will benefit much more from this device than from a conventional pacemaker. Uh, the other thing is that we develop an um, algorithm to better diagnose and earlier diagnose sorry, uh, cancer. Uh, like digestive cancer or rare, rare disease. And last but not least, we also develop um, um, custom-made devices in spine surgery based on those data so that we really have a, the best device for a given patient. So that's the type of usage that we have as manufacturer. Now to do that, we need to use data which are uh, based at the hospital level, at the claims level of uh, health uh, insurance funds, but also in our own database. So we need to collaborate, public and private, to be able to have access to those data and share them together, but also to develop a method of analysis that are scientifically sound so that we know what we do. And to go maybe to, to, to a very concrete example of this type of uh, collaboration that we do, we are participating to a research hospital universitaire uh, whose name is TOPS, so I always forgot I need to, so it's search treatment and improve outcome for patients with aortic stenosis. And this is laid by Professor Elena Elshaninov at the uh, hospital, uh, University Hospital of Rouen. And uh, what we do is that we work with the Scientific Society of Cardiology in France, and we are using data from our registry, data from the hospitals, match them with claim data, to try to really understand what is the patient pathway, what, what is the benefit, what is the risks of patient treated with transcatheter valves, which used to be a very innovative treatment um, uh, five or six years ago. Um, and uh, what would be very interested with uh, European health data space is to compare practices in France with other European countries and, and what will be the result of this type of treatment in different uh, countries. So that's uh, the example of what we use and the type of collaboration we, we need to have, no choice. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, that's very essential and also good that you bring those concrete examples. And that's now we're getting to the end to the, towards this roundtable and hand over to Isabel to see those concrete examples. Do you think you can actually illustrate them for the digital um, health ethics principles, for example? Do, do, will you engage the private sector in this implementation? What are the next steps? Well, um, for the ethical principle, it's it was just, ah, I used to say that it wasn't for the fun to have a new text on, you know, on the table. What we target now is to apply them. So um, we are working with the team uh, to, um, to implement it. We have a, another major event during the French presidency in June with all uh, the, the representatives of the ministers of health uh, gathering in Paris. It will be the first time in three years. So it will, I think it will be a, a nice time also to agree on how we want to implement those principles, how we want to communicate about them, how we will uh, report to the citizen. Because as we do in France for the national roadmap, we want to have a transparency, a transparent reporting uh, up to the citizen. Uh, you know that we have a citizen co committee in France with, with uh, which we, we work to implement the national roadmap and uh, we, our dream is to replicate this at European level too. So that uh, every single uh, initiative or opportunity or advancement that we can envision for digital health in Europe will also be uh, co-designed, I would say, not only with the private sector, the public sector, but also up to the citizen. This is very important because our ultimate goal basically is to serve the citizen. So to bring new services uh, in and, and, you know, implement them. As Joanna was mentioning, some of them are already in place. Uh, at the time being, no single citizen would understand why he doesn't have the same access to care in Europe whenever uh, we are in mobility, each of us. 
So uh, this is something that we need to, to have in mind, is that we need to uh, go up to, to the cities. Thank you, Isabel. Another strong message. And uh, I'd like to leave each of you with a concluding remark and handing over to Joanna. Uh, if you can switch to let Joanna uh, appear. Could so, Joanna, if you're still with us. Yes, yes, oh, yes. Oh, perfect. Um, so, my question would be, could you give us, um, like, as we know, in a few days, we have the publication of the regulation. Could you, what's the next steps for you? So, could you give us, like, a, with all the actors around in this roundtable, what would be a call for action from your perspective? I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, uh, we are working on the regulations, so I wouldn't give a... <laughs> I wouldn't really call it a, uh, only a few days, so uh, we'll be indeed adopted. The aim of the Commission is to adopt it the, um, this, uh, this spring, uh, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, basically this, uh, this regulation will have an impact on the, um, the way that uh, the healthcare uh, is, uh, is basically the access to data in the context of the healthcare and also the reuse of data for research policy making uh, uh, regulatory purposes is being done. Uh, we hope that this will uh, be influenced by, by uh, in positive, in a positive way, by uh, this proposal. Um, in the meantime, I think it's very important that, uh, in parallel, we try to uh, ensure the implementation of um, uh, and the preparation for the implementation and all the work together with the ECHL network and also with the joint action towards the European Health Data Space. Uh, aim uh, at uh, this element. So um, the ethical principles are also very important elements that uh, are guiding the uh, approach, especially for the rights of individual. Um, and uh, it will be very important that the, the um, implementation of the member states takes, uh, takes them into account. We are going also to launch a capacity building exercise to support that member states build their capacity at national level, uh, also taking into account the ethical principles uh, uh, put forward by the French presidency. So we hope that uh, uh, all these elements together will have a positive impact on, on, on uh, uh, people's lives. Thank you, Joanna. Now handing over to Marcus, what is the main key message you take over from this round table and for the next steps as part of TEDAS? <clears throat> I think I, I'll take home the message that, that uh, there's a lot of progress on, uh, on European health data space, a lot of progress on ethics, and we call for action that, that all the member states will support and, and will be involved in this progressive uh, regulation coming this spring. What about you, Frédéric? Well, I, I'll try to summarize in two words, trust and collaboration. I think without trust, without, we, we won't have any European health data space, we won't have any market around that. So that's, uh, that's the two things which are very important. And I think the project right now that uh, you are working on, but we are also participating in, is uh, really the foundation to build that trust. And we do that collaboratively, so that's, uh, that's a great project. What about you, Emmanuel? Well, uh, we're facing, all of us, we're facing a lot of bottlenecks. And uh, I think we're all, it's very important for this uh, legislative text at the European level to, to be published and to try to do something uniform on all the countries. So are we, it's not to put pressure on you, Anna, but we have very high expectations about the text. <laughs> and. Uh, no, this is very important, and, and actually we hardly talked about the application of the such uh, space. We talked about all the problems and so on. So let's say that for me, at least, it's very clear that if we had had this space during the pandemic, it would have changed the management of the pandemic totally, totally. So hopefully we'll be ready soon. Thank you. And Isabel, one word uh, for the next steps for the European Health Data Space to leave the audience with. Well, we have an incredible opportunity with this text, and that's why we are all, uh, I would say, on the same boat, and we, we, we are dreaming about uh, the next uh, stages. Uh, this is a new level of ambition for digital health in Europe, and uh, the Commission and the Member States 
and together with the private sector, everybody has been, has been working very hard for many years to come to that. So now that we have uh, uh, also a, the ethical principles in place, I think that it's, we have uh, a lot of uh, green lights to, to move to this next ambition for Europe and provide